Good evening. My name is Christopher Chappell, and I'm the Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology and the Director of the Master of Arts in Yoga Studies here at Loyola Marymount University. And I want to welcome the people in the room and in the Zoom room and say on behalf of the folks um, that we're just very, very appreciative for our program administrator, our administrative coordinator, our faculty that are present, our graduate students that are present. And I want to say a special namaste to Catherine Budoff, who is here with us from the theater department, and Abhishek, who, uh, Jane, who is here with us from theological studies, to Dr. Zoe Slatoff, our Sanskrit professor, who is the convener of this Wednesday evening series, and um, say hello to, thanks to Ayana and Jackie and Emily and all the folks in Bryce that Gabby. <laughs> hey, Gabby. <laughs> so I want to introduce this evening's speaker in, um, from a place of long-time connection and deep affection. And Dr. Nancy Martin had done work at the University of Chicago before landing blessedly at graduate, graduate Theological Union, where she worked with Linda Hess, with Houston Smith, a little bit with Robert Goldman, a little bit. <laughs> so, uh, and spent many, many, many episodes in India, in Vrindavan, in Rajasthan, in Pune a bit, studying the life, the legend, the poetry, the post-death poetry, which she will explain, of uh, the great Saint Mirabai. And Mirabai, as you may know, was a devotee of Lord Krishna, who really transformed bhakti within India and provided a significant role model inspiring women in India ever since. And in my own yoga training dating back to the 1970s, my teacher, a woman from Calcutta, would just lift up Mirabai as the one who endures and the one who inspires. And like that, during her long career at Chapman University, where she chairs the Department of Religious Studies, Nancy has inspired students. And we were just reminiscing that 22 years ago, right now, we convened a, a series of events parallel to none with none other than Malika Sarabhai, of uh, Mahabharata Peter Brook fame from the renowned Sarabhai family that worked so closely with Gandhi, transformed herself into Mirabai through dance. And we brought scholars, we had musicians of various genres. It was a truly, truly remarkable event. And before we had all of these wonderful technologies to capture and to record. So we have memories uh, and memories of um, hither and yon and welcoming in of so many lovely people from the broader Indian community. Her recent book, which she will, I think, show us a picture of, uh, is out with Oxford University Press and look forward to two additional volumes as she will explain. She's widely published in such periodicals as the Journal of Vaishnava Studies and has been a stalwart of the American Academy of Religion for many years. Okay, so thank, thank you and welcome. <laughs> Ah, 
Okay. This is the book. <laughs> yeah. Can everyone on Zoom, if your camera's on, give me a thumbs up that you can see the slides? Somebody? All right, fabulous. So you have someone to admit there. Oh. You can make me the host again if you want. Or co host, and I can see it. I don't know how much you know about Minerva. Is she someone that you've run into before? A little bit? I ran into her as a, a graduate student. No, I better not project too much. <laughs> <laughs> I ran into her as a graduate student. And at the time, there was a little bit out there about Mira. There wasn't a lot. And that was kind of curious because there was lots of material, recent stuff written on Kabir and Surdas and Andal and Mahadevi Aka, but not on Mira. Everybody mentioned her, but the question of who was she really was the question I started out with. And that was a long time ago, uh, more than 30 years ago. And The one next to it. Oh, sorry, on the mouse that you had, you were clicking the back arrow. If you move up. The second one on the bottom. Oh, on the bottom. Yes. I can't see that. Uh -huh. Oh. On the screen. It's not quite bright enough. So let me just there it leave it in the same place. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Who was she? Who is she? You can start to hear about her everywhere, but it's not clear, and people say lots of different things. She was a 16th century, we think, Rajput woman who would become the most popular poet saint of the Bhakti tradition, female poet saint, North India. She was praised and continues to be as the greatest pre-modern poetess of the Hindi language. Gandhi held her up as an ideal practitioner of nonviolence. She is now a pan-Indian cultural character. All of these things are adjectives we might give for her. Many people are first introduced to her with her poetry. And so this is one of my favorites. The young woman is dancing at regular performances where women get dressed up and dance as Mirabai in India competitions. It goes like this. Tying bells to her ankles, Mira danced away. I chose to serve Narayan, she said. Really, I took the servant's role, tying bells to her ankles, Mira danced away. Mirabai's crazy, they said. Mother-in-law said, family destroyer. Tying bells to her ankles, Mira danced away. The Rana's get a poison cup. Laughing, Mira drank it down. Tying bells to her ankles, Mira danced away. Mira's lord, the gallant mountain bearer, mountain bearer. so easily the indestructible one was hers. Tying bells to her ankles, Mira danced away. All right, we hear that and we're intrigued, right? Who is this woman who dances away and laughs when people give her poison? Well, most of the time, if you start to look around and try to find out who Mira is, you get the standard historical biography. This is what's taught in Hindi literature, in schools, etc. And according to the story, she was a princess of a minor kingdom based in Merita, Rajasthan, in love with Krishna from childhood. She was, according to this version, happily married to a prince in the great kingdom of Mewar, and his name was Bodhraj. But her husband died, as well as her father and her father-in-law, and only then did she return to her childhood devotion. Her solace as a widow and appropriate to her status, and primarily her songs were in the mode of viraha, of love and longing in separation. She was persecuted by a despicable brother-in-law, just one person in the family, um, when he came to be the Rana because he saw her public worship as bringing dishonor to the family. She eventually leaves the palace to become a wandering saint, 
spending her final days in Krishna's holy city of Dwarka and merging with Krishna's image there when Narana tries to call it back. All right. Okay, so that's interesting, but it's kind of boring. <laughs> All right, if you compare it to Mah Mahadevi Akka, and, uh, this story, though, is pro widely propagated, and these are examples of illustrations that you find in a government museum that is now next door to her temple, the temple where she's supposed to have worshipped as a child in the city of Merta, um, touching her husband's feet like a good wife should, you know, standing beside his body on his death, etc. And then they're on, of course, trying to. Um, we know that she probably lived in the 16th century because the first references we have are late 16th century. Um, but there's a lack of any kind of real historical sources about her. There are claims that there are some 16th, 16th century, 17th century sources, but we don't know that they're accurate. The reference, the single reference, it's hearsay. And the only copies of that manuscript we have are from the mid uh, 19th century. And it's a, doesn't necessarily mean it was there to begin with. We can, don't have any earlier manuscripts. And it's hearsay anyway, and all it says is she was married to both Roach. Um, maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. But the early 16th century was a time of the consolidation of Rajput rule and their assertion of a kind of Rajput unified identity. So things like honor were really important and the isolation of royal women especially, et cetera, as well as a tight feudal system. And she also, this period of time, the early 16th century was the time of the rediscovery of Vrindavan as Krishna's holy city and the consolidation of Vaishnava Sampradayas. Her voice, when we hear it, is in opposition to those things. Um, how do we know who she is then if we don't have any history? Well, we have to look to the stories that are told about her. And we have to look to, we have to come to know her the way you come to know other people. We have to ask the people who know her. What did she mean to them? What do they remember? How did they interact with her? So that's what I set out to do. And the first place we have to look is in hagiography because that's where you find her first. Well, you find her slightly earlier in some of the other Bhakta poems, uh, Hari Ram Yas, but just a reference. All right, so the very first telling that we have about her comes from Navadas, if you're familiar at all with Bhakti hagiography. He composed his Bhakta Mal in around 1600, and he was from the Ram Ramanandi Sampradaya, and this was part of a, a very inclusive move on the part of this Sampradaya to include people of all different types of bhakti in a larger bhakti sensibility. Broadly Vaishnava, but very broadly. And this is what he had to say about her. Abandoning worldly shame, honor, shame, and family tradition, she sang for the mountain bearer. Like a gopi, she embodied love, made manifest in this degenerate age. Without restraint, utterly fearless, her tongue sang the praises of he who knows love's ways. Wicked ones found fault and planned a murderous revenge but not a single hair on her head was harmed. She drank their poison as ambrosia. She beat the drum of devotion, a shame before none, abandoning worldly honor and shame and family tradition. She sang of the mountain bearer. So already we begin to see some of the things she's really known for. Drinking poison, being shameless, disregarding honor and family tradition. Beating the drum of devotion, in the world and being like a modern day gopi. Okay. We first begin to get the real story with Priyadas. He writes a century later uh, out of the Gavya Sampraday, but he was a performer of Navadas's Bhakta Mal. And he writes a longer story. Each one of these stories that these hagiographers are telling also have a bunch of context and they have reasons they're telling the stories the way they are. Um, there's some complex things going on in the formation of Sampradayas during the time when Priyadas is composing this. But also, there are standard tropes that are in hagiography. So some of the things are unique to Mira. Some of the things are things she shares with other women saints in particular. Um, I'm going to give you a lot of pictures here to illustrate these little points about Mira. Um, the pictures come from all over the place. I've tried to label them. So in this case, these are pictures from a... Uh, 
very recent TV serial about Mirabai from 2009. So they don't go back to Prados, but they're for your entertainment and because I don't have time to show you all, talk about all those things so you can see some visions. Okay, so again, her here her, her devotion is set in her childhood. And that's true for almost all the women saints' hagiographies. It seems to be important that they should have been devoted to God from the beginning, whether it's Krishna or Shiva, whatever. And so we find her this way, and there are many elements of the stories about this, but Pridas just pretty much tells us she's born in Merita and she loved Krishna from the beginning. Um, more illustrations, comic book is the one in green. The others on the other side are kind of Desai, uh, a Gandhian uh, artist um, composing or doing making these these paintings in the 1940s. According to Priyadas, she was not a willing participant in her marriage. She did the ritual, but she was thinking of Krishna through the whole thing. Um, and she insisted on taking her Krishna image with her to her new home. She got in trouble with her in-laws right away because she wouldn't do the things she was supposed to do as a daughter-in-law uh, in worshiping the, the cool Devi, the family goddess, um, in order to ensure his health and long life. Um, she also has a series of encounters with men outside the family in Priyadasa's telling. One is a lustful sadhu, a guy that lies to her and says, Krishna told me that you should make love to me. And she says to him, well, okay, Krishna said that. Here, have something to eat and let me prepare the place. So she sets up a bed in the middle of all the devotees and then says to him, if Krishna ordered it, go ahead, enjoy yourself. And of course, he's totally ashamed and becomes her disciple. Um, and then she also, there's a story of Akbar coming to see her. He hears about her and he wants to go see her see what she's like. And so he comes with Tansen, but they dress up like Hindu holy men. And- Tell everybody who Akbar is. Akbar is the, the Mughal emperor. Okay. He was known for, for dressing up in disguise, just to see what was happening around his kingdom. So this is not only a Mirabai story. He is very impressed with her. There's no sense of any particular interaction in Priyadasa's telling, but there's the sense that he came to hear and Tonson composed a song in her honor. He seems to be drawn by her beauty rather than her poetry, which is what draws him to someone like Sordas, but hey, what can we say? And then she also meets Jeeva Swami. She goes, she leaves because things are difficult at home. Uh, and with the Rana, Priyadasa isn't clear whether it's her husband, her father-in-law, her brother-in-law. He kind of leaves that generic. And, but she goes to Vrindavan on a pilgrimage and she meets Jeev Goswami. Priyadas just says they met each other. Uh, later stories will say he refused to see her because he didn't talk to women. And she sent back a little message that said, well, here I thought there was only one male in Vrindavan, Krishna, and everybody else was supposed to be a gopi or female. And then he saw her. Okay, but that's a standard trope in hagiography too, that women have to be tested in some way, just prove that they're really devotees. So later people add that test episode, but Priyas is a Gaudiya Sampradaya member and he's not likely to do that. And maybe he makes this connection to connect Mira to his own Sampradaya. We don't know. Okay. Um, and then of course there were the attempts to kill her in this particular version of Priyadas, or Priyadas's version, the Rana sends poison. It doesn't work. She looks even more radiant after she drinks it. And then he also set, he sends a spy to spy on her and says, when you hear her conversing with men, because there are accusations because she hangs out with sadhus, that she is uh, impure, then come and tell me. So the spy hears her seemingly talking to someone, tells the Rana, the Rana comes sword in hand, walks into the room and there's no one there except Krishna. And Mirabai invites him to have Darshan and he backs away. He's not, he's not uh, pleased with her nonetheless, but he doesn't kill her. And there's variations on this story too. And Krishna picks up a, he's playing checkers with her, picks up a piece and he's standing there, et cetera. In another case, he sees four mirrors and can't decide which one to kill. 
she leaves eventually. And she goes to Marwa, to Mewa, uh, sorry, she leaves Mewa and she goes to Dwarka. And according to this story, that's where she ends her life. She merges with the image of Krishna because the Rana decides things are going badly and it must be because I was bad to Mira, so come back, maybe at a change of heart, or to know exactly, but she doesn't want to go back. And so she calls on Krishna to save her and she merges with this image. That's this kind of story from Piedas sort of sets it sets the tone, and there's a whole series of other stories that build on it. But it's not the original. It's very clear that there were other stories floating around at the time that Priyadas composed this. And we know this because of one of these here, the Prima Mode was a, was a, was a kind of drama uh, in three acts that was um, composed by an unknown author for the court of Guru Gobind Singh. And this one, they kind of make fun of Mira, but it only really works because they know the same kind of stories that Priyadas is talking about. But Mira is married, and happily so, to a prince who just happens to be named Girdari, the same name that she calls Krishna. But she doesn't know that it is Krishna, and he doesn't really know he's Krishna either. And it goes on from there. But what's evident is there are other stories floating around. And Priyadas is one story that has Priyadas and Navadas, people imitate them and they expand on it. But it's not the original story. It's just one of the stories. And there are other stories. Um, I have to probably just let these go, but you can see there's a whole range here of types of stories. The Charasi Vaishnava Kibarta is a Balava Sampradai text, and Mira's rejected in that one. She's rejected because she's not a disciple, but also because she hangs out with people from all different walks of devotion and recognizes them all. Um, and that's not okay in Christian. Um, Nagridas strings together songs of hers with narrative uh, in it. And he has her husband dying be before the Ranas start tormenting her. Um, that wasn't mentioned on the earlier ones. Mahipati is writing in the in Maharashtra for the Varkari Sampradai. He has Mira as always a child, and all the all the persecution that happens to her happens because of her parents, because she's not willing to marry like her father wants her to. But she's much more innocent, maybe kind of domesticated, but it sort of fits into the Varkari idea of Krishna. Their images are more, more parental. Um, the deity is more like a cow pining for her calf. That's the way God cares for us, or a friend. So it fits, but it also is pretty domesticated. Suksaran's Karchi is a much later text filled with miracles. And he turns this into a kind of way, in spite of the fact that it's about Mira, a way to tell women that they should, they could work Bhakti out with married life and they should do so. So not exactly Mira's message, but that's what it means. Okay. When we get to the colonial period, the British are really intrigued with Mira. I mean, she kind of fits that romantic image of this passionate woman. And it also fits their colonial language about Indian men who are brutal and mean and Mirabai needs rescuing. I mean, that fits their kind of rhetoric, hyper-masculinity, et cetera. So they like her uh, and they get attracted to her right from the start with Colonel James Todd uh, writing about her in his Annals and Antiquities of Rajasthan. And then uh, the next picture, both of these pictures are actually from the city palace in Udaipur that they didn't used to be there, but they have been more recently added to uh, the palace museum. And the second one is the desk where uh, the historian um, Shamadas wrote his history of Mewar and began to counter some of the colonial histories. And he starts to reclaim Mirabai, but the Mirabai he's reclaiming is more like the one I started with for you. And that this, the story that I started with, the one where she's the good wife and doesn't turn to devotion until after he's gone, et cetera, et cetera. That one comes from Munshi Devi Prasad and a circle of other members of Mira's natal family, the descendants. About five guys actually seem to be the sources of the story, but it's a kind of a Rajput reclaiming of Mira. Um, everybody's talking about Mira by this time. He's writing in 1898. Everybody's talking about Mira because 
the British are, among other things, condemning India for the treatment of women, right? That's the kind of standard colonial excuse. And so Mirabai is being lifted up as a woman of strength. And also there's a turn towards Rajputs as these warriors who are the ones who are emblematic of strong Indian ability to defend themselves against an enemy. And also you can tell Rajput history and not get censored by the British. If you, if you spoke directly against the British, you'd be in trouble. But if you talk about Rajput history against the Muslim invaders, you can get away with it even if you're really talking about the British. At any rate, they retell Mira's story and claim historical verification. But their story depends heavily on Priyadas, on the order of the events in her life that he lays out, so on hagiography, not history. And it's full of, if we're being generous, it's full of assumptions that they make about how a Rajput woman really would have behaved. Okay. So that's the story that comes through there. And she's really set in her Rajput context and in Rajasthan. There is another story that starts circulating as well, which is by Man Mathana Dutt. Uh, Dutt. And he's writing about the heroines of India. And there's lots of stories about the heroines that, that also come up in this time. The ones who, like the Rani of Jhansi, take over and save their kingdoms. They act as men because they need to, and it's, they have to. And there's a whole genre of stories about those heroic women. And in this particular version uh, of her tale, some this influences Munchi Devi Prasad's telling as well. But here it's full blown because this story of Mira appears with all those heroines of Ind. And she is at the end in a little addendum, but as the best of the best of Indian women. And he tells another story of her. And again, here she is a good wife, at least initially, and they get along. She marries him, no problem, and all that stuff. They kind of start with this. But then they kind of grow apart. It's modeling the sort of kind of uh, male-female relation of the new patriarchy. Yeah. And she becomes more and more spiritual. There's more and more distance between them. And then Akbar shows up. And she doesn't know that he shows up. She doesn't know who he is. She didn't invite him. But he comes into the temple. Maybe he even touches her feet. And he gives her a necklace for Krishna. His jewelers find out, not too hard to find out who gave this, who had this beautiful piece of jewelry made. It's Akbar. So he tells her, he doesn't even tell her directly. He sends somebody who says, first he wants someone to kill her. They won't. So then he sends a message delivered to her that she must kill herself for dishonoring Mewar. She asks, couldn't, couldn't we talk about this? Perfect for the new patriarchy. He says no. He doesn't even talk to her directly again. He just says no. What you've done is too bad. And so she goes to the river to drown herself, <coughs> throws herself in, but Krishna saves her. Um, and sends her out. You're free from your husband now. And then she becomes a wandering devotee. She goes to Vrindavan. She meets Duke Goswami there. And people flock to her. And pretty soon the Rana hears. He hears that people are still loving his wife and they're all mad at him. So he gets in disguise and he goes to Vrindavan as a, as a holy man and he begs from her. And she says, what well, I have to give you? Beg from somebody rich. And then he reveals who he is and asks her to come back. And she says, of course I'll come back. When would I ever do anything my husband did, didn't want to do? I have to do that. <laughs> and so they go back happily ever after in his town. <laughs> so you can see that these are versions of Mira that leave some things out. And in the history of Munchi Devi Prasad, he's very specific that he's leaving out things that stories people made up. They really aren't right about Mira, so he's trying to set the record straight. But he's leaving some big things out, and we'll get to that. Um, their story, though, gets picked up by Banki Bihari, who writes a biography of Mirabai in 1932. 
called the story of Mirabai. There's also Bhakta Mira in another publication of the same work. It gets picked up by Gita Press. And I don't know how much you know about Gita Press, um, but the people behind Gita Press are about setting up a kind of broad devotion of a Hindu orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And the founding people uh, have a lot in common with the current government. Let's put it that way. The version that Banki Bihari tells combines those two, Dutt and Devi Prasad, and adds some more devotion to it. And he speaks throughout the book of Mira as a child. Right? So she becomes this otherworldly kind of devotee. But also, this is the standard version everybody's going to get. And the illustrations here are from the Amar Chitra Katha comic book that comes out decades later, but also is widely distributed through schools and still widely available. Monkey Bihari's text is illustrated there, but it's really this domesticated mirror, yeah. severely domesticated mirror. Um, but others would kind of draw, try to draw on her strengths for the nationalist movement. So Tagore writes, he has references to Mira among his characters in uh, several places, it's looking to her as a figure for emancipation, but also easily co-opted into a kind of devotion to one's husband, marrying her devotion to Krishna. Gandhi looks to her as a model for nonviolence, fearless with independent conscious, conscience, consciousness and she or him she has to be married because it's her satyagraha against her husband nonviolent of course always loving that is why she's such a strong example um but she never does anything to disturb him either, right? <laughs> except for this she just holds to the truth she also begins to become a model for the acceptance of women of determination who want to pursue a higher goal um, the way for them won't be easy, but if there's a precedent, eventually such women win respect and support with Mira because people begin to understand what they're doing and begin to accept it because of Mira. And Mahadevi Barma is a perfect example. She was a, the first modern Hindi poet. She was, she refused, she was forced into a childhood marriage, but she never recognized it. She lived independently. She was active in the constructionist dimension of the um, nationalist movement. She was an advocate for Hindi literature, education of women, very powerful woman. And people made sense of her also through the example of Mira. She resisted it initially, but then she came to really appreciate the way in which Mira made some of, made her life possible. At first she said, when people called her that, they seemed to be just taking her poetry, which wasn't really bhakti. It was about something much different than that. But on the surface, it seemed a bit like it. And she thought they were misrepresenting it, which they were, right? But Mira was there. So this is a little more, this is a little more feisty Mira, right? Um, but this idea of Mira as a kind of cultural heroine still keeping tight reins on her behavior as a in terms of disrupting, um, disrupting the, the smooth sailing of the boat of nationalism by bringing up too much women's independence was something that had to be maintained. Um, Subalakshmi's film that was released, it, the Hindi version was released right on the cusp of independence. Um, it's a beautiful film and she's a very strong Mira, um, it, but it's also a very middle-class kind of Mira, a very sweet Mira. And the film sort of rehabilitates Baudrillard, just like uh, Dutch started to do when he came and is dressed up and apologized to her. This one even more so begins to rehabilitate him as a character. Her songs of Mira were recorded. She became, for many people in India, and still to some degree is, Mira, both in voice and in her way of living in the world. Again, a complex story, but we have to move on. But what are these stories not telling? What are they hiding from our notion of Mira? What are they trying to overwrite or silence? Well, they're trying to overwrite or silence a lot of other mirrors that are out there. I'll just give you two examples. One is a folk drama, maybe dating back uh, even before 
uh, Moshi Devi Prasad. We just don't know um, when this particular one was written or composed. There's a couple, but Lachi Ram uh, is, was one of the most famous of the one particular style of folk drama. This story, the folk drama form, was performed in villages, initially by groups of local actors who would get together and decide they were going to perform it. The written text or script for this is fairly, fairly tight, so you can expound on it a lot. But it tells Mira's story as a romance. As a story about a woman who fell in love with a man who was not acceptable to her family. In this case, it was Krishna. About her forced arranged marriage, one that she resists, even threatens to commit suicide, but ultimately she can't resist. Um, she does it, she agrees finally, after beating her servants. She's not exactly a nice hero in that sense. But she does what a woman in her position might do, take out her frustration on someone below her. It's not right, and they say it's not right in the drama, but it's realistic. But she is, she has to go through with the marriage because otherwise the her in-laws will attack her family. So she agrees to do it, but then she insists on marrying a sword, which is a, instead of doing it with him and her image. And they sneak around and make that happen. And he's a little surprised, but, and then, so she's going off with him to his place his new home and she's there and they're talking and he's being nice. He says, I want to see you. I've been waiting for this night. This is great. Let's get to it. And she keeps saying, don't make me do what I don't want to do. And he says, here, have a little wine. No, don't make me do. He's, he's, very, he's a very honorable man. He doesn't force anything on her. But the story brings up issues of arranged marriage, issues of love marriage and the disruptive nature of that, as well as the wonderful nature of it. And underneath that little banter is the prospect of marital rape, something which does come up in some later novels of Mira. And it ends, uh, in a, there's a, it brings up a little of the other stuff, but very quickly, the other kinds of things. And she ends up leaving and going off into the forest. Okay. But that's the most of it is the romance. And the forest is the place uh, where the only place where she can find that she can remain. But there's another telling. And there are others too that are folk dramas. But this one I have the full story of, and it's a great story. And I would commend it to you. Um, this is a story of, about. This is a story about Amira who also must agree to a marriage that she doesn't want because of the situation. But it starts with her birth and the celebration, the automatic beating of sounding of tals instead of the beating that's usually done when sons are born, they beat by themselves. Now you can already see that women listening to this are gonna go, yay. <laughs> And there's a series of things like that that are the celebration of a daughter. They go through in detail the calling of the astrologer and the bringing of gifts and the exchanges that go on between people just to enjoy it and to celebrate the birth of a girl. And then there's also, they move on to her, oh, she takes Raidas as a guru. We didn't hear about Raidas in Mochi David Prasad, right? And I don't know if you know who Raidas is, but he's a leather worker guru. Yeah. Not someone who the Rajputs would want their daughter to be the disciple of, but very popularly considered to be his disciple, including in the one, the, the, the 1693 one in Guru Gobind Singh's court. Um, she insists on being Raidas's guru. He says, no, your, your, your grandfather will be angry. The house will be angry at you for doing this. She says, no, I want to be your guru, and I will be. And so finally he accepts her. And she puts on saffron dress and she starts doing the things of a sadhu and her family just freaks out. And they go, we've got to get this girl married quickly. And we got to make sure that whoever we marry her to, they don't find out till the marriage is solemnized. So they, she is forced to marry. Actually, this is the one where she beats her servants, not in the, not in the one in the, the, uh, oh, the folk drama one. That's too, that's too much for the sort of general village 
context. But here, she she beats her servants when they bring her clothes. Clothes. She doesn't. She does though go through it to protect her mother primarily, because her mother comes to her in a posture of begging, lays her sorry at the edge of her pull it down on the ground and says, please. So she agrees to go when she takes some stones that she uses for her worship that represent a shalagram. She picks up a stone when she's a kid and starts treating it as a shalagram, an anti-comic version of Vishnu, Krishna. Um, and she gets, she goes through the, the marriage, she has to, and she goes back and she's trying to behave. She doesn't know how to behave properly, but she's trying. She gets to the palace of the king, the Ramana, and he has already 16 wives. And when she gets down to, they come out to honor her, but she's the youngest. So she gets down to try to honor them first and the stones fall on the ground and they think she's a sorceress. <laughs> and they all go back to their palaces and they lock them up and they lock the run out too. And he goes from house to house, palace to palace, and they won't let him in. Meanwhile, she's in her new place. And she tells her maidservants, watch for him, tell me if he's coming. And she takes off her bridal clothes and puts on the dress of a sannyasa again, and she's worshiping. But he comes in the back door, and he sees her, and he says, what are you doing? Who who, who you worship? And who's your guru? And she says, my guru is Radhidas, Radhidas, Jamar. And he immediately rejects her, vehemently. And she begs him, please. Let me stay outside the palace walls and I'll weave your dotis for you. I'll weave your clothes. And he says, no, you have ruined my palace. You have, I want nothing from you. And in this, it's all very beautifully done, but you hear the voice of every woman abandoned. And you also hear the wisdom of low caste people as well as women saying, you can try to compromise with those who are oppressing you, but you're still dependent on them. They may accept your terms, but at any moment they can refuse. And some people don't like this particular moment in this story because it doesn't really fit the lit literary theory. She's not, she's begging. But the people who sing it do. And the next thing that happens is Mira grabs a pillar she wraps her arms around it and she shatters the bangles that she's that mark her marriage and also are only allowed for high caste people. And she leaves. Um, so in that moment, you can see how bankrupt caste is. Right? Mary didn't change one iota. But from that moment, he heard these words. She's totally different. So there's layers upon layers of people's wisdom in these traditions, challenges to the status quo, and just wisdom and insight packed into those stories. Those are the kind of stories that Munchi Devi Prasad didn't particularly like. Okay? And you can see why, because the stories challenge and mirror the challenge. I wish I had time to tell you the rest of the story, but I don't, so we'll, we'll move on from there. But this is a picture of Radhidas. Okay, what do these multiple stories tell us? What do we do with this? Now, I've told you a whole bunch of stories of Mary. What do we do with this multiplicity? Well, it tells us a, a variety of things. One thing is that we to really know who Mira is, we need to know the range and ways in which people have loved her and interacted with her. Um, and it's it, they also reveal the many ways that she speaks directly to them, to their lives, and to what's what matters to them. The power that she generates, that she has, also generates a lot of these kind of stories like Munshi Prasad and and Dutt and Banki Bihari where people are trying to domesticate her and use her for their agendas. They want the power. They want the way, the fact that people love her, but they want it for their reasons. You know, the geographers do to some degrees too, but still they have an agenda um, and they don't want the, they don't want the other parts of me. So they try to silence them, but there's a persistence of these alternate tellings 
And this reveals the disruptive potential um, inherent in her life and character. If you take out all the conflict, you also take out the power, right? Because that's what is there. That's why Mira is so powerful because of these elements of that story. Many people also speak of Mira as a kind of companion in their lives. Never the translators say this directly, right? Even some of the people who domesticate her say that. She's made a tremendous difference in their lives in various ways to, that, were, that were positive, made them stronger people, made called on their better angels, so to speak. Okay? Um, but it also means that you are also free, I am free, to walk with her and to explore how she might be an empowering presence in our lives in any given moment and in different ways at different times. So I hope it frees you up to think, what does Mira mean or might she mean to me? Uh, and in what ways might she inspire me? I'm gonna go through really quickly a few examples. There are women who live lives like Mira and specifically draw on her. These are a few examples, Lakshmi Bai called Mira Mataji, who left her family she, she was a devotee like Mira. She was forced to marry. She had children. One day, a flute, but she was still devoted. One day, according to the stories, a flute appeared between her and her husband, and then her family finally let her go and become a spiritual leader. She had a series of, of disciples, women of different ages, four different close disciples, and they lived on their own outside of San Prados, settled in Vrindavan. Mira Jiyav Mewa, she grew up in a little village in Rajasthan, and similarly fell in love with Mira, well, she went into a crisis as a, as a young adolescent and only Mira's songs comforted her and seemed to, to speak what was happening to her. And she began to compose in Mira's name until her guru told her she shouldn't. Um, she eventually established an ashram also in Vrindavan uh, with the Nimarka Sampradai Sadhu who himself dresses in Saki Bhav. That's another interesting story. Uh, another woman, Bansi Dari Mira, she dresses as Krishna. And I've seen her dance in a temple with men in Sakibab, being gopis, dancing around a woman dressed as Krishna. She also does uh, talks and other things. And finally, one final example, Indira Devi Miloy, um, another fascinating woman, but she met Mirabai in trance states for about 40 years. And her guru, Dilip Kumar Roy, actually also heard Mira speak after a time. And she brought back stories and songs and teachings from Mira um, that spoke to her life, but also speak to people of our contemporary world. You might also know Mira from songs of Mira, so I'll say briefly just a couple words about that. Um, this is a, probably Mira's most famous song. She's most known for the, the most popular Mira song. Um, there is no other O sadhus, though I have searched the three worlds, brother, friend, relative, kin, all I left behind. Sitting in the company of sadhus, I abandoned the world's expectations. Watching devotees, I was delighted. Looking at the world, I wept. The vine of love grew, watered by the river of my tears. Churning the milk, I extracted its pure essence, discarding the rest. Drinking the poison, the rana scent, I attained immeasurable bliss. Mira has bound herself to love. Whatever will be, will be. Okay, the songs are in oral. They were composed in oral tradition as oral songs, not in poetry. She didn't write them down. Um, they were performed in a devotional context. Uh, meaning is added to the songs as they continue to be performed, completed by the singers and the audiences. This is an improvisational and milieu. Even she probably didn't sing them the same way every time. Um, and people, they circulated, other people picked them up, they added to them, they changed them, et cetera. There's no early records, written records from Mira. And clearly there were others composing and singing in her voice. There were also attempts to domesticate this voice. The most popular, uh, popularly available English translations are a set of 201 translated by A.J. Alston from Parshram Chaturvedi. And this collection is highly curated uh, initially by, he made his first collection in 1932. And in 1949, Prasad Sukul 
published a set of poems he said were from authentic manuscripts. Manuscripts disappeared. Nobody could find them again. Amazing. But it's a highly Vaishnavai, Vaishnava version of Mira, fitting that kind of Gita Press, Banki Bihari version of Mira. Um, but it's the most widely available, and it's the source that many people use for translating into English. Um, but there are lots of other songs. Um, these, and what is it that you can say in these words? Why, why, what kind of things does it talk about? Well, it speaks about love and devotion to God and a spiritual realization, but also of other loves and longings, of unspoken and sometimes forbidden passions, of the joys of embodied passion fulfilled, of suffering and grief, of domestic violence. They kept trying to kill her. That's domestic violence. Of abuse and oppression. And also for some people, it is a way to, for the first time, perhaps, to speak um, of individual wants and desires to the first person I, so characteristic of her voice, of who I am and what I want. And that's something really difficult for oppressed people sometimes, especially in India in the context of very low caste people and also of women. And it's still hard for women to say those things and for some men as well. But singing Mira's songs, you can practice making those statements and learn to say them and learn to articulate your own voice. Mm -hmm. um, there's a series of examples I could give you of co-authorship and companionship. The women I talked to, I mentioned to you just a bit ago, some of them composed in her names and songs about her. Um, Mahadevi Varma, her mother taught her initially how to meditate by singing, having her sing a song about Mira. She used Mira's song to explain it to her, to be silent and to listen to that still small voice. And eventually Indira Devi learned to, and she also learned to begin to compose poetry by adding verses to her mother's songs, devotional songs. Um, Gandhi selectively chose which of Mira's songs supported his, his um, idea of what she represented. And lots of people do that. That's Katasta, that's what Katha speakers do. And that's how uh, Vina Howard suggests um, that Gandhi often spoke. Malika Sarabhai, she's been mentioned, but she, the first time she danced, Mira, she danced it with her mother, and it was her, when her mother danced that dance with her daughter, she finally came out of her depression after her husband's death. She found herself again and her ability to dance. Um, Robert Bly, Andrew Schelling, Chloe Martinez is one of the latest translators. Lots of people translate Mira too, and that's another way that people engage with her and co-author her works. Um, here's a small translation by Chloe Martinez. Chloe Martinez is a scholar of Mira, and she's just begun to translate. So I'm very excited that these will be very interesting new translations by someone who knows the language of Mira and also uh, really has immersed herself in Mira since she was a master's student in Rajasthan uh, 30 years ago. So she knows Mira and she's just published a few uh, Mira songs so far, but I commend her to you as someone who can do that. And translation is also co-authorship, of course, because you have to get inside the song and move out. All of these translators have wonderful things to say about their experience of doing this. I just don't have time to tell you today. And then others like Janine Cannon, she's a psychiatrist. She happened to have an Indian patient who mentioned Mira too. And she's also a poet. So she started to get to know Mira and she translated a few. And then she wrote this beautiful song that is not Mira, but it's about Mira. And it draws on images from all those songs. And when you read it, you see Mira and many of those elements that are the elements that are not in the stage translations of Ulster. So um, I recommend you also to. And then, in closing, I invite you to get to know Mira Mai better. A woman with a strong sense of who she was and of her own value. A woman of fearless courage and unshakable determination. No matter what anybody else said. Okay? A woman who insisted on living in the world as it should be, not as it is. It doesn't have to be this way. 
and she would deliver it. And a woman who loved fiercely and joyously. Thank you. So are you willing to take some questions? Absolutely. Great. I have a question. Yes. Um, you speak you spoke about, you know, these moments where people found Mira or discovered their connection. And I would just wanted to hear how you found Mira and what, you know, what what did you find in her in that first meeting that really connected you to her? Um I didn't actually. I mean, I think Mira found me in that way. I I was in grad school, like so many of you. And I am a religious studies scholar, so I want I really wanted to learn about all the religions of the world and see how much I could understand them and communicate them to other people. And I decided I wanted to go to India to do my field research because I've been to India several times among, among other places in Asia. And it's such a fascinating place for a scholar of religion, right? Because there's every way of being religious there. I was also really interested in, in women's religious lives and in mysticism across cultures. And so Bhakti just seemed the ticket, right? And then I, I had to study, I didn't have any language background, so I'm gonna to go to India and I'm gonna do something in India, I need a language. And all that was offered in the summer when I wanted to start was Hindi. So that sort of meant I had to be in North India. And then I came across Mira. But the first things I read were that sort of domesticated biography, which was kind of like, hmm, interesting, but not gripping on that version. But there seemed to be something there. And then Alston's translations, they're very good in the sense of being very close to the original. So if, you're, if you want to use someone's English translations to make your own translations from, his are close to the original texts. Not like Robert Bly, who's wonderful, but it's more Bly. Andrew Schelling is also a great translator, but he's also a great poet. And so you hear his voice as well. Um, and the same for many of the other people. Those are good, but they're also kind of stilted. Okay? And I really didn't understand Krishna devotion at the time. So I was up against a lot of things to make sense of Mir. But there was something there. And there was, why was there not this classic study of this saint when she's everywhere? So in a sense, I feel like she found me and I went in search of her. Um, and of course, as you can tell by the way I talk about her, I also fell in love with her. <laughs> she's an amazing, uh, she's an amazing uh, reality and ongoing presence in so many people's lives. And to study her was to study all these other things also about India and about women. And so, she has been a companion in my life also. Um, I understand her in some ways and have learned over, I'm glad I didn't write the book till now, even though perhaps I should have written it much earlier. Um, my own life experiences allow me to see parts of Mira that I might not have seen at other life stages. So in that sense, she's also been my companion across all these years. So I guess that's the best way I can answer your question. Thank you for sharing. Uh -huh. I was completely unfamiliar. So thank you for your talk. That was amazing. And I'd love to learn more. So would you shamelessly plug your book for us? Because I am very curious. Well, this is my book. And it's Mirabai, by the making of a saint. So it includes all of those hagiographic texts. And it also includes the 19th century and the um, both the British uh, and the Rajput historical constructions. And then the next next chapter covers the, the um, folk drama and the folk ep epic tradition. And uh, chapter five covers Gandhi Tagore and Mahadevi Varma. And the last chapter covers those more popular culture and contested views, including, I didn't mention it, but a, an Oxford University Press children's book that has a drama that the kids are supposed to enact about Mira and it's 
it's really dismal. If you, if you think the kids would probably be crying by the end of, a, of it for poor Mira because they're trying, Mira, they don't want Gandhi and Gandhi's Mirabai to be out there at that time. So, and then the last chapter comes up to the edge of independence and it closes with Subalakshmi's performance. And it is just the beginning, the second volume that, that I'm working on. I have two other volumes nearly ready to go. And so you've got some of those volumes too. The second volume will be on the, on the song traditions and, um, and the construction of the co-authorship of those and, and the ways in which people engage. And the third volume will be post-colonial and global incarnations and invocations of the saint. Thank you. Were you ever in the presence of someone doing trance and creating channeling Mirabai? I was not. I did have the the and and I'm I don't generally want to use the word channeling, although there is a, there is in the literature a citation of a woman, a Bengali uh, woman who is said to be an incarnation of the goddess Kali, and she has it is reported that that she did, Mira did speak through her among other saints. But the woman that I did meet was Indira Devi, the one I mentioned to you that met Mirabai in trance for 40 years. And I met her just before she died. And I wasn't in her presence when she was in Samadhi or coming back and talking about Mira, but I asked her about it. And she looked at me with a twinkle in her eye, in her eye and she said, when I asked her if Mirabai was still coming to her and she said, do you think I'd tell you if she was? <laughs> but then she did tell me. And um, she's just a, an amazing, she's an amazing person anyway. Um, and her interaction with Mira, I read as a kind of, it sort of is a Leela for all the other ways in which people engage with Mira in narrative and song. Um, she's pretty unusual and pretty amazing person. And I'm glad I got to at least meet her briefly. I've gone back to see her community and talk with them, but she passed away shortly after our event. So I consider myself lucky to have done so. Or blessed is the case. Does uh, a geographical tradition mention uh, centered around Mirabai? Have the story of Gojaraja or is her husband uh, her, centered on um, her husband or anything? Bojrad is not mentioned in until the 18th century or 19th century. And he's kind of, as Jack Colley says, he's kind of convenient because he dies young and you know he has no children. And so he's kind of a, conven a convenient person to marry her off to because there's considerable contention over exactly who her husband is over the years. Some people say Rana Kumba, there's a lot of traditions around that. But the hagiography doesn't talk about that. And even in even in Priyadas's story, when they talk about the Rana, it's not clear who exactly is the one that's persecuting her. Because Bodhrat never becomes Rana anyway. But um and in mid let's see mid I don't think about the exact dates. In the 17th century, they're still not even talking about her husband, particularly in some of the other literature, like the other Bhaktamals that model themselves after Navadas. Um, I think the probably the soonest we sort of get a positive reading of the way in which um, the Rajputs look to her is in, until the beginning of the 18th century, maybe even later, maybe mid 18th century. Could even be 1800. I have to check the date on one thing that I've read recently, and I don't remember the date of, of that particular commentary. But so it's not, it's the naming of her husband is not there. And, and, uh, but his persecution of her is. And his debt, his having him die doesn't show up till mid 18th century in uh, Nagridas's Padapurasan model. Then he dies. But the other ones uh, before that, they don't talk about him dying. And that's the reason she does any of that stuff. That's all that's comes up later with the history. And generally, they also don't speak about her mother dying. But in Devi Prasad's story, her mother dies. And that was curious to me. Why does her mother die? She's there at the marriage on all these other stories. Well, 
they're using a narrative frame from the literature of heroines uh, with female heroines in, in Indian history. And all those women's stories, their mothers die too. Why do their mothers die? Because women would not act like men if they were raised properly by a mother, right? So the only excuse you can give for why they behave like this is because they were raised by men. <laughs> and in Nira's case, she was raised by her grandfather who was a warrior, right? And that's the way the story is told. He was a warrior and he taught her all these things about statescraft and all this other stuff. We have a question. From Chris and Sandra here, they typed it up. I saw your, their hands were raised, but they also typed it in the chat here, which is, Dr. Martin, have you witnessed contemporary male devotees of Mirabai? And if so, how do they practice devotion to her or Krishna? Yeah, I can give you a very specific example of, of um, well, Bhante Bihari was a devotee of Mira. He considered Mira his guru. And he left his law practice in Allahabad and he went to Vrindavan because Mira told him to. So even though he wrote this much more popular version of and more domesticated version of Mira, he was a devotee of Mira. And she was his guru. He he's considered himself a disciple of him. Um, there was also um, V.S. Iyer in Madras at the turn of the 20th century. He felt that he had been possessed by Mira in an experience and that she remained with him. And he led a movement. Uh, he was one of the leaders of a movement in Madras that was a, a bhakti practicing group movement. And he brought men and women together to sing uh, devotional songs in that movement. And he himself considered himself to be um, possessed by her for the rest of his life. There's another sadhu in Texas who similarly is a devotee of Mira and he came to our conference that um, Chris mentioned earlier as a delegate to the conference. And he was there and I was watching and thinking about it and I suddenly realized he was also dressed in women's clothes. He was being Mira. <laughs> He didn't really talk about that part of his devotion, but it was to that degree, I think. And he continues also to have a center in, um, in Texas. It's also the case that I have known several male singers who were particularly pro performers of Mira, very as steeped in devotion as any other um, devotional singer would be. And Mira obviously spoke to their lives as well in what ways I don't know because I would never had the chance to ask them. But she's, and she's very meaningful to lots of people who are low caste, men as well as women. The singers of the Janamatri, that folk epic that I described to you, they're male. We don't know who composed it. But, and there are sometimes, there's one husband and wife team that do it. Women don't sing it by themselves, although there's lots of women's insight and women characters, very strong women characters in it, which suggests women contributed tremendously to the composition. But uh, Padmaram, uh, for example, um, is one of the great singers of Mirabai and very devoted to her. So it's it doesn't have to be a male or female thing in that sense. Mira can speak to lots of people. And Bhandi Bihar is a perfect example of that. But also even the person who wrote the Amor, quote unquote historical version of Mira that has even some other kinds of, uh, goes off on more tangents, Herman Getz. Um, he too wrote about how Mira had made such a difference in his own life. The only person he thought that she was comparable to was Jesus. Hmm. Um, so it's not just a, it's not just a girl thing. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask about, um, you, you talk about the dancing. And if, it, if if the dance was choreographed and it's the same dances or series of dances that are repeated, or is it that one moves with the spirit? Uh, much more that one moves with the spirit. Um, in, in Merta, in the temple where she is said to have worshiped as a child, I have sat in that temple with groups of women um, and, and also in other temples in Jaipur. And you begin to sing the songs of Mira or some other saint, but Mira particularly, I remember, um, this was actually in Gopinathji in Jaipur, uh, 
I was there with an older woman who was kind of a teacher among the other women. She was, she had daughters-in-law to take care of things at home. And she, I, I met her because she knew a lot of mirror songs, but she asked the women to sing a mirror song. So they started to sing this one song where Mira says, Rana, I don't like your country. All the people there are trash. <laughs> and she rejects a lot of things. And they were singing this with absolute glee. And the women got up to dance. And it was mostly women in the temple. So the saris fell a little bit off the shoulder and this kind of thing. And they were just delighted and singing with absolute glee, maybe speaking to the Ranas in their own lives. <laughs> so, And Parita Mukta has said, suggested that that non-specificity of the Rana, which is a, it's a title for the for the king of Mewar, but the non-specificity of it in the song traditions especially means that you can use it to talk about any Rana <laughs> that might be oppressing you. <laughs> So thank you so much. This has been delightful. Oh, I have I have some uh, cards here that have different pictures of Mira on them and different examples of Mira's poetry that my translation. So if you would like to take one, you can. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, congratulations on the book, and thank we look forward to two more. <laughs> so why? <Yeah. laughs> Thank you very much. Thank it's you. my pleasure <laughs> to share Mirabai.